Welcome to SpyCast, the official podcast of the International Spy Museum. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Hammond, the museum's historian and curator. Every week we explore some aspect of the past, present or future of intelligence and espionage. Can we ask a favour? Can you please consider leaving us a five-star review so that other listeners can find us? Coming up next on SpyCast. To sit in front of an arms dealer, of Iranian arms leader with some clergy sitting in front of you and refusing to look you in the eye. He simply lowered his eyes to show his disdain for me while his uh, military personnel at the side did uh, the bargaining on specific weapon systems that they wanted. SpyCast is excited to announce its first annual month-long deep dive on a single country. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel and the 50th of the Yom Kippur War. Last week was an overview of Israeli intelligence, what it is and how it came into being, while next week we'll look at the intelligence failure that was the Yom Kippur War. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you don't miss any of these installments. This week's guest is Uzi Arad. He was formerly the National Security Advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister and Chair of the National Security Council between 2009 and 2011. In fact, the Prime Minister he served as once again the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uzi was also formerly the Foreign Policy Advisor to Netanyahu between 1997 and 1999. Uzi has also advised the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee, but between 1975 and 1997, he was in the Mossad, rising to become head of intelligence, that is, the analytic arm of Mossad. He is a big get for the podcast, and I'm glad we can bring you his insights into intelligence and policy at the very highest level. In this episode, Uzi and I discuss where intelligence meets policy, the importance of alliances at the strategic level, how proximity to power affects your ability to shape it, and the politicization of intelligence. The original podcast on intelligence since 2006, we are SpyCast. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Okay, well, thanks ever so much for taking the time to speak to me, Uzi. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to discussing Israeli intelligence and your time as the National Security Advisor with you. Well, it is a pleasure to be with you, and these are subjects of which are close to my heart, so I'm glad to be talking to you about them. And I just wondered if you could tell us about your very first day as the National Security Advisor. So this is something that the vast majority of us will never be at the very senior level of, of government making foreign policy decisions, uh, influencing foreign policy decisions, informing the decision makers and so forth. So, yeah, what was that like? Well, I, I must uh, explain the background. It is very true that uh, the role of a national security advisor is critical, and it exists uh, with the same name, of course, in America and in other English-speaking nations. Britain has adopted the same terminology in other countries, and they have been functioning with this uh, mechanism for a long time. The Israeli exceptionalism has been that in spite of Israel's very heavy agenda in foreign and defense issues, there was not uh, a National Security Council in place until very late. In the very first, say, 50 years, the Israeli leadership had operated without such an organism. And the big question is, how come? What caused it? Uh, the absence was glaring. The answer is very technical, and uh, only if you look at the uh, organizational charts of uh, uh, security systems, you would understand. The other Israeli exception lives has been for the first 50 years of Israel's existence that the prime ministership and the defense ministry were combined. It is the same person, initially it was Israel's founder, David Ben-Gurion, who held the 
defense portfolio and at the same time the prime minister. So uh, he, the integration here was accomplished by the simple overlap between those two positions. And uh, things proceeded presumably normally. Uh, the matter became clear and much more difficult at a time in which the prime minister was not defense minister. So he did not have the full uh, machinery of the defense community at his disposal, and he suddenly became naked at the top. <laughs> then Can be a good uh, feeling. there was a need. <laughs> when, when did that first happen, Uzi? When was the first time the roles split off from prime minister and defense minister? On the eve of the first uh, of the 1967 war, when uh, the Egyptians had marched into the Sinai, the Israelis had mobilized, we were ready, and there was a, a very strong outcry in the nation uh, to have the Prime Minister Eshkol take on a defense minister. And of course, he chose Moshe Dayan, remember this uh, military hero, to assume the role. And it was the need of the time. From that moment on, uh, in most times, uh, the, the positions were separate. But when Rabin held the job some 30 years later, he also took advantage, and for a minute or two, uh, I mean more than a minute or two, he held both positions. So when was the National Security Advisor role? Who was the first? When did it begin? Well, you know, people looked at it almost from the first time that things like that were operating in America. Everybody looked at America. We look up to America, and we look up to American experience and professionalism. Uh, but actually, it was after the inquiry into our intelligence failure in 73, there was what is the equivalent of a royal commission of inquiry in Israel, um, and they found out that the absence of a coordinating body, policy body, at the top that would integrate everything uh, policy-wise uh, was noticeable, and they recommended the creation of such a body. But that did not happen because there was resistance from the other institutions because, as you know, there is no vacuum in bureaucratic life. So when the uh, National Security Council, uh, Council did not exist, others have filled the vacuum. So now, if you want to create a NSC at the top, uh, other institutions have to relinquish some of their uh, powers. Which almost never happens. True, <laughs> but it took an, uh, an uphill fight. And here, if you ask me personally, uh, I was among those who, from the very early phase, from 75 and 6, consistently urged uh, uh, the creation of that NSC. And mind you, my position could be really be taken, uh, how I should say, as a national point of view, because at the time of the Mossad, I was at the Mossad. So presumably, I had a kind of a, of a, of a sectarian role. But in spite of my being Mossad, I took the national point of view and argued that it is in the best interest of the Mossad to have an NSC in place as our top consumer. And I pursued that uh, using my uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, activities. And finally, uh, the occasion, we succeeded in that when in 1999, Netanyahu, before leaving office, benefited from a unique occasion in which there was no strong Minister of Defense. And he pushed ahead, at my advice, an established cabinet decision that created the NSC. And you count the existence of Israel's NSC from 1999, me being there at the creation. You're there at the creation, you are fighting for this role, and then a number of years later, you find yourself inhabiting the role. So tell us what that was like. What was it like to envision a particular role and then to be stepping into it? Were you happy the way that it had been 
carved out thus far or did you want to take it in a particular direction? I served in the Mossad and my highest ambition uh, from the beginning was not to become the head of the Mossad. I did not think I qualified to become the head. I was very satisfied becoming the deputy director of the Mossad for Intelligence. That was my ambition. And in a way, I reached that position, and then I became foreign policy advisor to the prime minister. But once the NSC was created, and very much at my insistence, and with the law being uh, drafted at my advice, it was almost in inevitable. It depended on only one thing, on Netanyahu returning to power, because at the time he was out of power. But once he succeeded in winning his way back, a major comeback for him, he himself said that uh, choosing me was uh, inevitable. Uh, so, and I was challenged by that, and I thought that my two primary objectives at the time, they were dual. One, to manage the NSC as one should, uh, referring to the statement of missions, but at the same time, to make it stronger and to make it an institution that will last. Just to go back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, so most people will never get to that kind of level uh, within a government. So you're one of the 0.0001% of people who have been there. So tell our listeners, what, what is that like? Was it like the first day on the job? I'll, I'll give you the answer. It will look, in a way, ridiculous. But that's the stuff of life. When it comes to power and to the authorities in power, what matters is proximity and access to the top. The distance, the sheer distance. It is one thing to be located in an office which is two blocks away from the president or the prime minister. It's another thing to be located, say, in another building, and it's quite another to be 10 feet from his office and from the uh, conference room. So the thing I had to do on the first day is to simply raid the emptying Prime Minister's office because it was being vacated and taking my troop and occupy by strength the offices I wanted, which were, as I said, 10 feet from the Prime Minister in the conference room. And that is how we spent the first day, occupying much greater proximity. It is a point which people understand. The ability to be there, to be there present each moment, the ability to enter his office with one minute without having to knock on the door is the essence of influence and the essence of being there. You know, the, the further away uh, you are from that, your power is reduced exponentially. So that is how we, we did it the first day. And much to my uh, delight, I succeeded in moving the entire NSC apparatus from its Tel Aviv-located premises and to move the Jerusalem offices into what we call in Israel the aquarium. And the aquarium is like the Oval Office uh, and, you know, and the adjacent offices. And we were there. And, uh, and that is not insignificant in terms of our abilities to dispense our duties. And when you were talking there, it reminded me of Brzezinski, President Carter's National Security Advisor, uh, and in the various memoirs that came out of that administration, basically Brzezinski used that proximity to circumvent Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, and to circumvent other people. And in his memoirs, he talks about being there, being proximate to the events, being able to constantly provide input as a game changer in terms of influencing the, pres influencing the President or the Prime Minister. That's very true. And as I said before, I observed, uh, always I've been observing the American NSCs. Even when I was at Mossad, 
I, you know, I started my uh, my Mossad career when Kissinger. No, it wasn't Kissinger was both Secretary of, uh, of Foreign Affairs and Secretary of State and NSC at the time. And then when Brzezinski came to power, first I knew him, and second I looked how he decided to plan his term of service. And we looked at each one of those uh, uh, American embassies, uh, I think, in terms of their functioning. And many of us thought that Skullcraft, for example, was the ideal uh, NSC. He got, he got the job right and handled himself correctly, which, for example, was my model for me, not to, to do it as a high-profile function as Kissinger gave it, but to do it quietly and very much behind the curtains, uh, as Kohlkraft did. We looked also at the British example. Uh, the British example is very interesting. You're familiar with it, with all the British eccentricities and emphasis on consensus building and the way they managed it. I think uh, there, is a, there is also a, a, a functions like that look at each other collegially. Secondly, are in touch with one another. There's a club of national security advisors, and they often handle themselves uh, today with a means of communication uh, very, very frequently. But also we look at how they perform, and, uh, and we learn from one another. We certainly, as I said, we looked up, and I say that seriously, to the uh, highest degree of uh, professional uh, management at the British and the Americans, but other NSCs, uh, which are different, say the French uh, or other countries, uh, also uh, serve as a, use, uh, a useful model. In the American system, it's meant to be a coordination role. It's not meant to be formulating policy. Like you say, it has played out in different ways. We've got the Kissinger example, the Brzezinski example, Skullcroft and others. H how did you play the role out? Were you mainly coordinating in Israel, it's slightly different. It is very much a policy role, very much. But what, the, what does it mean, policy? It means that whenever the bodies that decide, that make decisions in Israel, are the cabinet. Now, in our case, the cabinet is the body of the ministers. The ministers, uh, the secretaries in American language, that is defense, foreign affairs, treasury, and the like, they are as a collective, can decide. Israel, for example, if it goes to war or if it wants to make peace, has the full cabinet decide on it by majority voting. Uh, the prime minister serves as the primus inter pares among them. He is the chairman, but he cannot do it single-handedly. Now, usually uh, we have... Two such one. The full cabinet in Israel involves more than 20, 25 ministers. That's too many. So they formed a subset, a subcommittee of uh, the full cabinet, which in Israel is called the cabinet, but it is in relation to only defense and foreign affairs cabinet, and it can count no more than half. Now, the way it is structured is that every decision has to get its final approval from that body. Um, it is in the way the supreme commander of Israel, primarily on cardinal issues like war and peace and related activities. The role of the NSC is to be a second to the prime minister in chairing the meeting. The, the, the prime minister chairs all those meetings. He is the final decision maker. But I sit at his side. And I help him in controlling the process through which this decision is taken. Now, what does this mean? We have bylaws in Israel as a result of uh, failures and lessons from failures how a meeting should be conducted. For example, it is a matter of principle. First, intelligence. Second, the problem. Third, alternative options, the objective. Then, evaluating options. 
then deciding on a course of action, then who does what. Now, to, to take it through this process, the National Security Council is the one which is managing that process and making sure that all who need to be there are there. So often, for example, when I had very severe battles with my master, the prime minister, is because every once in a while, he felt like he did not want to have the foreign minister in the room because he always had all kind of political and other considerations. I insisted. I said it is compulsory. So I was the one who was, why so? For the sake of integration. Every stakeholder and every body who had some responsibility, including to present alternative courses of action. So this is very much the integration of the decision-making process, the policy-making process, which uh, the NSC does. We do not do intelligence integration. That's really, really interesting. And I think a good way to bring the role alive would be, could you discuss the first crisis or the first major event that happened that you were involved in? I think the Iran revolution, which changed the architecture of power in the Middle East, was a major event. Uh, but as National Security Advisor, which was many years later, uh, this involved, uh, well, the end of the Cold War. Uh, look, I must tell you a story, for example. I was once visiting, in my uh, Director of Intelligence capacity, I was visiting uh, the, the German uh, intelligence service in Pulach, and was talking to a head of a division there, a very distinguished uh, general. And after we exhausted the business at hand, uh, I had some free time to chat. So, you know, without thinking much, um, I asked him uh, whether there would be a time in which uh, there could be a German uh, unification. Because... East Germany was ten, a few, few miles, scores of miles from the Pulach compound. Now, when he heard me, uh, I could see him stiffen because he knew that if he were to say that he is looking forward to that, that implies some sense of ambition. So very, very cautiously, he said, yes, I think this would come, but it would take 50 years uh, for this to occur. So, well, 50 years. Well, it happened six months later. This one, the collapse of the, uh, of the wall in Germany and the end of the Cold War is a high point in terms of how we pursued that and how we had to interpret that because then the major question was what will be the new world order? How disorderly that will become and how we should uh, align our policies in accordance with the new circumstances. To help you digest this episode, here's a short interlude in something Uzi discusses, why the end of the Cold War mattered for the Middle East. In 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, which led President Jimmy Carter to declare that any attempt to gain control of the Persian Gulf would be resisted by the United States by any measure necessary, including military force. The thought being that the invasion was part of an effort to do just that. It was so serious, in fact, that he called it the greatest threat to the peace since the Second World War. I raise this event to highlight the underlying strategic importance of the region for the Cold War superpower contest. Indeed, just after World War II, US policymakers recognized that it was, quote, a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history, close quotes. The end of the Cold War mattered for the Middle East in many ways then, as the shift from a bipolar world to a unipolar world would end the superpower struggle for influence and control in the region. The flow of arms and other forms of aid, for example, to the region would be radically changed. If Israel had been the largest recipient of aid from the US in the region, 
Syria had been the largest recipient of Soviet aid. This spigot for Syria was now turned off as the USSR dissolved, which in turn would affect the Israeli-Syrian relationship. The end of the Cold War would reduce superpower proxy conflicts in the region. In Yemen, for example, the country was divided into the Soviet-supported and Marxist People's Democratic Republic of Yemen in the south, while the US had provided aid and support to the Yemen Arab Republic in the north. Changed geopolitical realities would likewise reshape the pattern of alliances in the region and change the nature of the Arab-Israeli conflict. For example, the Soviets backed the Arab states in the Six-Day War in 1967 and the Yom Kippur War in 1973. They also provided support to the PLO with diplomatic recognition and diplomatic support, financial aid and military assistance. But when the Soviet Union became no more, this all changed and US influence in the region was much more pronounced. One question that I find quite interesting, when you were the National Security Advisor, how important were relationships, and I mean outside of the country, so international relationships, regional relationships, and were those things that you already had because of your previous positions? Just tell us a little bit more about how important relationships, partners, allies are to Israel, to the National Security Advisor role. Well, it is singularly important. And I'll say there is also uh, some practice in the area that can be referred to. But just reflect on that in the following way. You know that uh, the other NSCs, be it the British or the Americans, are in the habit of producing either an annual or a multi-annual document, usually called National Security Strategy. And if you look at the basic structure of all these documents and compare their methodologies or table of contents, you notice that when they think in about strategy, usually it breaks down into managing power or talking about power threats, and then there is a constant presence of the subject of alliances. Managing alliances is the stuff of statesmanship, and statesmanship is the so-called, to speak, the diplomatic, perhaps, pursuit of international activity. So the existence of alliances is, is, a, is a constant presence. Secondly, you notice that even the greatest superpowers cannot act unilaterally. None did. Even the United States said uh, at the highest point, relatively, of its power, um, had and preferred to work with allies for the usual reason that alliances uh, work. It is burden sharing and improving the chances of success. Uh, secondly, sometimes you create coalitions and they become fixtures. The Atlantic Alliance was such a fixture. Now, uh, Israel is in a completely different uh, condition. Israel is a relatively small country, um, and it had been isolated. It had been uh, delegitimized at its very creation. Uh, there was a host of countries that wanted to see it evaporate. At the same time, Israel certainly could not have successfully survived without some friends either informal friends or friends and comrades, uh, or formalized as allies. And gradually, Israel did develop uh, alliances on all levels. And let me, because we're dealing on intelligence and policy, let me tell you that both have their systems of alliances. The national alliances are easily understood. It is those countries in which sometimes you have a defense treaty that uh, regulates their relationship. So we're all familiar with the major alliances of the world. Uh, they have their multilateral structures, they have their pooling, they have their synchronization practices, and often they function very well. 
uh, it is alliances who won the wars, and sometimes alliances who make the peace. Intelligence is different. Uh, intelligence alliances are often parallel alliances that they parallel the national alliances. So, for example, if, if America or Britain or Germany or the Netherlands uh, are um, national allies of Israel, it stands to reason that our intelligence communities would have their network at their level, so to speak, intelligence channels, or sometimes multilateral consulting. The Five Eyes system, for example, is such a structure. You would not be surprised if there were to be such networks at the intelligence level, which, of course, have their uh, uh, interconnect with the national. But here comes the surprise, which is clearly the case in Israel. We also have networks with our enemies because sometimes it is the role of those bodies which operate in secrecy and to engage in contacts sometimes with the enemy. Sometimes you have to dialogue with the enemy. Sometimes you want to break ice with the enemy through intelligence, discrete channels. So you, it shouldn't surprise you that on one hand, Israel, like other countries, has its intelligence network with allies which operate under the roles of identity of interest and proximity of values. And this is a coalition of friends. But every once in a while, we have our channels, including personal ones, because you asked the validity or the value of personal channels, with leaders of countries that we are at confrontation with, sometimes to compensate for the enmity. So that is to say, at the level, at the national level, we are at war. We are at differences. But under the surface, we sometimes interact to lessen or to control. And to give you just one uh, example, which I often talk to uh, with Israeli friends in my uh, professional lecturing, to tell them uh, how thankless and how, in a way, dirty that kind of uh, relationship is. I said, if we were in existence during the Second World War, it is I who would have worked with the SS, with the Nazis. Because indeed, during the war, there were some behind the curtain contact between even the worst uh, and the very worst. To give you an example, Eichmann. Eichmann, the head uh, planner of the Holocaust in Hungary and elsewhere, was willing to engage in a deal of saving lives against some, some lorries that with a so context like that were held and representatives of the Haganah before the war Israeli served went to Budapest to talk to Eichmann, knowing that we're talking to a murderer who is perhaps a beast, but there was expediency that demanded it. So sometimes this is the role we do and I had the, the pleasure sometimes of dealing with the enemy, and sometimes we became friends, uh, as we could as human beings. But sometimes, and that was not under the Israeli flag, that was done differently, I handled even the worst of our enemies. Can you share an example? Well, I think... Uh, uh, terrorist, I, terrorism I never liked to work with, that is to say, as a subject. As a phenomenon, of course, it is also a problem. But I, I came into contact, intelligence contact, with uh, each Arab and Muslim country uh, in one capacity or another, a collection capacity or a contact capacity. Uh, but at some times, uh, the, to give you just one example, the Iran gate, which is a cause célèbre 
in Washington and is held against the president at the time who had to apologize for doing the Iran gate. Well, as Israel was uh, complicit with the thing, we were the ones who were in contact with the Iranian government at the time. And there was a proposal of arms for money that then went to Central America because of American needs. So this was a plan in which the American side wanted us to give our share in helping them supplying the uh, Central American elements, and in which we brought to the table a capacity of doing some weapons uh, deal with the Iranians at the time. Now, I was involved in that affair. Um, so to sit in front of a arms dealer, of Iranian arms leader with some clergy sitting in front of you and refusing to look you in the eye, he simply lowered his eyes to show his disdain for me while his uh, military personnel at the side did uh, the bargaining on specific weapon systems that they wanted. Well, that was not a pleasant uh, occasion, and it was done. And here you have an example of things like that. But the thing I like much better uh, with these uh, intelligence and sometimes combined with policies is when we allies are acting beyond the call of duty in being cooperative and in helping one another. And uh, uh, the high point, if you wish, of those, such events are when you show even a degree of gallantry or chivalry. For example, when members of a fellow allied intelligence service is willing to put his life at risk of his own people, far, that is not to be taken lightly. I think one thing that would be quite interesting, uh, so we spoke about this previously, Uzi, the difference between intelligence, just at the level of intelligence, but then when intelligence connects with policy, so intelligence at the top, what did you learn? What was unique? The highest risk that we have been seeing and uh, that uh, factor uh, infect systems to varying degrees in different countries is the politicization of intelligence, because policy, almost by definition, is affected by politics, because these are uh, ideological sometimes issues. But intelligence, presumably, should be uh, devoid of value and should be strictly professional. And much of the criticism, internal American criticism of its own intelligence performance, is that it was politicized. It was used, it was distorted for policy purposes, or it was infested by political uh, pressures. That is true all over the world. It simply takes form differently. In Israel, I regret to say that uh, it is the political masters who sometimes corrupt the system because they bring to the table their political ambitions, their political positions, and sometimes they want intelligence to suit their purposes or to serve, or sometimes they look at the intelligence naysayers as those who want to uh, prevent them from taking action. And there is that built intention. I have been, and I had battles over that, I have been of the view that we should be cognizant of the fact that political masters have political considerations which are legitimate. At the same time, while taking that into account, we should be as professional and as depoliticized as we can, because it is a profession, a very difficult profession. In Israel, at this very moment, you see resistance from our current government and some antagonism from our government towards the defense establishment, claiming that some of us, because I'm a veteran 
are either leftist or anarchist or renegades. And you can look at it with historical distance, with a smile, but it is a very difficult position to be in. Let's talk about that for a second. So obviously we don't want to stray into the realm of ins and outs of Israeli politics, but th- th- there's some quite interesting things happening in Israel at the moment, as you say. So I'm just wondering, how did you first meet uh, Benjamin Netanyahu? Did, was it when you became his foreign policy advisor or was it previously? Well, let me tell you, at that time I was stationed in Paris. And usually my practice on uh, Friday our embassy was very close to uh, the Champs-Élysées, to an American cafe that was favored of Americans. And I would go there because they had some American magazines. And I bought the New York uh, uh, book review. And I opened this, as you know, it's a high quality uh, magazine uh, covering uh, literature, uh, foreign affairs and current affairs. And I opened the front page, and there is a glorious review about a book written by Netanyahu. I was elated. You know, Netanyahu was in Israel at the time. He was a rising politician. I was in Paris, far from the scene. And there I see in the New York Review of Books a critique which is superb of a book about the Inquisition, about the Spanish Inquisition. And I thought, at long last, we have a man who is capable of writing such high-level history. Only uh, half an hour later, it dawned on me that it was not Benjamin Netanyahu. It was his father, Professor Benzio Netanyahu, who wrote the book. But that was the first time I noticed. I first met him when I visited Israel. And I first met him when I came to the cabinet decisions in my capacity of director of intelligence at the Mossad. That's when I met him. And I must tell you that uh, I liked what I saw. And uh, apparently he too, because within a year, he asked me to, to become his foreign policy advisor. What year was it you were in Paris when you came across the New York Review of Books? Just roughly. I think 95, 96. 95. And then you met him uh, when you went back to Israel. I went to, I came to the cabinet. And, you know, he tells the story differently. Uh, He says there was a discussion that uh, everybody uh, was uh, um, given his view. And I gave a contrarian view. And which was, the issue was Iran. He says that. And he asked people, who's that guy? And they said uh, who I was. And he says that he was impressed because he thought the same, and I was the only one who was uh, close to his position. So that's very nice to say that, uh, but there is a little correction to be made. The subject was not Iran. The subject was Iraq. But with this little difference, Uh, The uh, experience is what has happened. Um, And since then, I I, I worked very closely to him because even when he was out of office, I stayed on uh, informally as a friend and advisor. So I was with him for 15 continuous years. Wow, that's a long period of time. And how would you evaluate uh, Benjamin Netanyahu? as a consumer of intelligence? As a consumer of intelligence? Well, you know, in the first place, as prime minister, it is the duty of uh, the military assistant to the prime minister to be the channel through which intelligence is fed to him. Uh, It was not from the NSC. Uh, I was receiving the same intelligence that he was receiving, but through other channels. So I did not observe at hand how did he read, absorb, discuss intelligence matters. And I knew, and I insisted on that, on separating intelligence from policy. I did not interfere in that process. I think he used intelligence, he read intelligence, and he listened to intelligence. 
But uh, if you evaluate uh, type of consumers, well, Churchill would be the ideal because Churchill, for example, would write back his comments. There would be a two-way street. He not only consumed intelligence, he knew his stuff. He was his reader, and he was writing comments in back, and that's the ideal consumer. Netanyahu would absorb, but not necessarily uh, relate back or uh, give feedback to the intelligence communities. And he took interest in um, um, in various types of con- of information, uh, not necessarily intelligence. Remember that, for example, Netanyahu, because of his American background, um, had many contacts with uh, key American congressmen. You know, uh, chairman of committees, some of those heavy lifting um, individuals, many seasoned uh, senators and congressmen who came to Israel, and he would meet with them, and he would talk shop with them, and they would talk about uh, global affairs. They would talk about it, and uh, Netanyahu loved it. Uh, his English was American, and when you listen to two or four or six of them talking, he looked like another you know, prominent senator talking about everything, including domestic American affairs, uh, including about other leaders or learning, and that was a source of information to him, primarily, for example, since we do not have intelligence in America. As you know, our our degree to which we can engage in intelligence gathering on Americans and in America is limited by mutual understandings. So Netanyahu had to rely on these uh, private discussions or uh, and, uh, and, and often you would talk about third parties. Uh, so he had keen interest in that. But to what extent he was attentive to the little details, uh, he's not a man of little detail, Netanyahu. Um, and uh, and um, he is a very fast-thinking, fast-consuming uh, yeah, uh, 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 decision makers, decision maker. Uh, I wish that sometimes he would play closer uh, attention to details and facts and be a smart and uh, sober consumer of intelligence uh, and uh, not one who sometimes evaluates uh, the intelligence on the merit does it serve me or does it not? And over those 15 years that you knew him, did you, did you see a lot of change in how he was, or, or was he really the same person all along? Well, you know, Andrew, uh, uh, you know, the older we get, we notice that people always change. People stay the same, and at the same time change constantly. And they remain the same because in many in many forms, their personality, uh, the personality itself and some of their cognitive and emotional, say, uh, psychology are constant there being uh, shaped by genes or culture uh, and everything. So that may remain, but even that changes with time. But then much else is the product of experience and maturation and learning so people change, and then circumstances change, and people change with circumstance. Only the other day, looking at the ranking of American presidents and noticing that those who rank as highest were Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, and you cannot avoid noticing that they were all war presidents. So the very act of being there at the moment of war, people rise and develop and perform under the circumstance of events. Now, Netanyahu has a very long longevity. He's been around for a long time. So he has changed in many, many ways uh, because of the events, other personalities, circumstances, his political fortunes, and um, 
So in many ways, it did change, or let's say the mixture of, uh, of qualities in him changed. And now he is, many people say that he has transformed into a different type of leader. Yeah. I yeah. do not accept everything they say about him. For example, saying that he aspires to be a dictator, I think is wrong. He is not a dictator at heart. What has happened is, that he is, he has found himself uh, in, in, implicit in corruption charges, and battling uh, those charges against him very much as Nixon did when he was found associated with the Watergate affair. That has changed his behavior, which became more desperate, and he took measures which are non-democratic. That that, but that's because his personality is under his personal crisis and trying to extricate himself from that crisis. So in that way, he, he, he has changed. But in so many ways, uh, some of his qualities were, uh, could be observed even in, in his youth, and they were observed as such. When was the last time you spoke to him, Uzi? Uh, uh, I think 10 years ago, exactly. I severed my ties with him once I finished uh, uh, my term, and then there was some residual need to do. But two years after that, uh, because we had, uh, I had, I confronted him. I had a big fight with him. Can you tell us what about? Well, about the fact that uh, we quarreled over the role of the National Security Council. I insisted to working by the law. I said, you must work by the law. And the law stipulates that, and we are responsible under the law. And he didn't understand. He called me a Boy Scout. He said that I did not understand his political needs, and he expected me not to work by the law, to which I... Uh, after two or three times, uh, told him that I would terminate. After two years, I wanted to cross that threshold of two years, uh, but that was a bitter uh, separation. Uh, he did not like that at all. Uh, he felt offended by that, and he acted accordingly. Uh, but uh, the issue was this. Uh, the issue was... and. You know, I used to give him advice in English. For example, I said, I would say, BB, always capture the high moral ground. Always. Whatever issue. Always work by the law. Not because it is the worthy thing to do, but because it pays. Because you will be caught sooner or later. Why will you be caught because in Israel's history, there is always a commission of inquiry about some kind of a mishap. Every two or three years, something wrong happens, there is a commission of inquiry. Then when that commission of inquiry starts to looking at your performance, what they look at is if you acted and performed under the bylaws and the laws. If you did procedurally wrong, then you're dead. And if you acted, you know, according to the procedural, then you get away with it. I said, so act under the law. He said, and his legal advisor said, but the law is bad. I told him, well, I think that income tax law is bad. So can I take liberties with that? I cannot. So change the law if you have the majority change the law, but do not break the law. Uh, what has happened, what is happening now, is precisely what I warned about. He did break the law. He was caught. And now he's trying to escape, you know, the law. And uh, so I, I had a good war, in a way. I was on the right side. We hear Uzi mention a Iran-Contra in this interview, but some of you might be asking, 
what was a Franc Contra? And indeed, it can get highly complex. But here is my attempt to boil it down for you. Iran-Contra was a covert operation by members of Ronald Reagan's national security team, but it almost cost Reagan his presidency. Reagan came to office promising support for anti-communist insurgencies around the world, the so-called Reagan Doctrine. Central America was of especial importance to the Reagan administration, and during the 1980s, the region was beset by communist insurgencies, often supported by Cuba and the Soviet Union. In Nicaragua, a Marxist group had actually come to power when the Sandinistas seized control in 1979. Opposing the Sandinistas were a disparate group of counter-revolutionaries, the Contras. Reagan supported the anti-communist Contras, but because the Contras were largely funded by the cocaine trade, remember at this time the US was in the early stages of the crack cocaine epidemic, Congress passed Boland Amendment in the early 1980s to ensure that no Department of Defense or CIA funding could make its way to them. Reagan's support continued unabated and his national security advisor would look to Iran as a congressional workaround. National security advisors came and went in the Reagan administration. He had six, which some scholars have suggested reflected the chaotic nature of the National Security Council decision-making process during his presidency. You'll recall that in 1979, the Iranian Revolution brought the Islamic cleric Ayatollah Khomeini to power and that there followed a 444-day crisis where American diplomats were held hostage. Fast forward to 1985, and an Iranian-backed terror group was now holding Americans hostage in Lebanon. To cut a long story short, a deal was made that the hostages would be released and the US supply Iran with weapons. Remember, at this point, Iran is in a long and extremely bloody war with its immediate neighbour, Iraq. At the time, there was also a trade embargo with Iran, and Reagan had said that he would not negotiate with terrorists. Essentially, the majority of the money from the arms sales was rerouted to the Contras, and we have three lines being crossed. Boland Amendment, Reagan's promise not to negotiate with terrorists, and Reagan's own 1983 embargo on selling arms to Iran. In 1986, a Lebanese newspaper reported on the deal, and the follow it would last for the rest of Reagan's second term in office. There were indictments, convictions and pardons, including for three CIA officers who were embroiled in the complicated entanglement that was Iran-Contra. That period that you were the national security advisor, you were there for the Arab Spring. Is that is that correct? Yes. Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, the Arab Spring uh, is relatively a simple thing. Uh, I will come back to your comment about how people, how our, our prime ministers uh, lose their job. Uh, you know how they rise to power and I, they lose power is a process that can be looked at. Um, but talking about the Arab Spring, look, I used to come to Egypt regularly uh, under the Mubarak. And of course, I would come there under the umbrella of the, uh, of the Egyptian intelligence service. And they're very good at their job. And uh, we traveled often in Cairo. But I couldn't help noticing that they are always quite nervous. You could see the edginess. And I asked myself, why is that? It's because obviously they could see what is coming from under them, you know, the Islamic uh, uh, displeasure and so forth. And this is the problem with revolution. Elections are regulated, so you know when uh, a disruption can happen. Revolution, you know, can happen any minute. So they have to be constantly on watch. So I could see this in the air, also, there was the case of Mubarak coming to his end and the succession issue. But when all this erupted, uh, it came as a surprise. Um, and to us, it was a risk because we had peace with, uh, with Egypt and Mubarak at long last. 
And uh, as I said, we had some good relations. And now suddenly an Islamic revolution with a strong uh, Islamic uh, presence. So we feared uh, for the continuation of our good relations. Luckily, even the new regime, when it came to power, maintained relations with us, which showed uh, the durability of this. But at the time, it came as a surprise. But some of us, uh, a former Israeli chief uh, of Mossad said that there would be a counter-revolution and that the military would come back, and he got it right. So now we have, uh, again, an Egypt which is ruled by a uh, military. Um, so we look at those upheavals. Uh, most of them, uh, they called the Arab Springs, but they are upheavals, and sometimes they, took, they take a very, very... Uh, wrong turn. What has happened in Syria, mind you, is a major catastrophe. We should have all known how cruel uh, civil wars could be. Uh, the civil war in Syria had cost half a million casualties in which Syrians killed Syrians. That's heartbreaking. Just take notice of the fact that in the entire duration of the Arab-Israeli conflict, if you go back to the 19th century, almost 150 years, the number of casualties that we sustained together is 50,000. And now, in this sad event of a civil war in Syria, you have half a million and we also look back at the fact that none of these uh, uh, things uh, turned into a democratic revolution. Nowhere. Be it Tunisia, nowhere. So these have been outbursts of, of, uh, of different characters in different countries. Some surprised us. Also, our ability to divine the future course has been very limited. Sometimes we felt as if Assad was about to fall, well, he's still around, uh, which shows you the limits of ability to predict, certainly to predict revolutions or their continuation or their backlash. Uh, but I looked at it um, with great interest. I guess democracy is codified disruption, where the disruption happens every four or five years and everyone knows how it all shakes out, but if disruption comes in a different way, then it's very difficult to know how that's all going to happen. But, you know, I wish, uh, we all need to see political change happening in the Middle East, uh, uh, and ideally, if there were cultures that could sustain it, uh, it would be better that it would be towards democratic and more secular governments, which would be progressive in their policies, for the betterment of their nationals. But we have a similar interest among the Palestinians. Look, it is not a state yet, but there is a Palestinian authority. It is now led by an elderly gentleman, Abu Mazen, who is neither democratic in his instincts and has also been less than uh, uh, the best type of leader to serve the Palestinian national interest. I wish there would be a process of a transition of power from Abu Mazen to future leadership among the Palestinians, one that would be less militant and certainly less corrupt and would be more democratic, responsible, and, um, and, and uh, in such ability would be able to conclude with us a final peace agreement one which also would reach, uh, would provide the Palestinians with a statehood and an and economic and uh, political security. So that is a transition yet to happen. And what, is there anything that you learned going from joining the Mossad to rising up to become a senior policymaker? So you, you get to see intelligence in all of its dimensions. Is there, is there also things that people that 
don't get to the upper echelons of intelligence? Is there is there something that they misunderstand about how intelligence actually works or functions uh, in terms of making policy that you would like to comment on? Well, you know, at the end of the day, the national security or strategy of nations also reflect the political culture and the political heritage and legacy of its history and of its geopolitical predicament of and the nation that uh, that is involved and that is why uh, policies and strategies differ from countries because again speaking when i worked in germany i could not fail to see that germany has been shaped by its location by its being outflanked from both sides and Britain, being insular, an insular island, has shaped everything in terms of its policies, orientation, and even culture is a reflection of its history. And all countries have such elements which are either undercurrents of the view, but sometimes do take form. In Israel's, what is, I think, very much embedded into our national security strategy or attitude towards our security is uh, the perils, uh, the existential perils that the Jewish people or the Jewish state have felt. Uh, to give you an example, in the 40s, the leadership of the Jewish community of the state not formed yet had been exposed to the possibility of extinction three times. One, 1942, when the German armies were moving up the northern, northern Africa, were about to overrun Egypt. No one had expected there that thanks to intelligence, superb intelligence, you know, they were blocked by the British in El Alamein and Alam Khalfa and so forth. At the time, we expected them to move on just as they moved into Western Europe. And there was fear here that this tiny Jewish community would be under uh, existential threat. Did not happen. The second time was when the realities of the Holocaust dawned on us, which the full scope of the Holocaust was not known. But by 45, it became known. We're flooded. I grew up, my parents were resistance fighters in Europe during the war. All of us have that legacy. But many of those in Israel, you know, came from the concentration camps. And they did not look like Holocaust uh, survivors we know now who are very elderly. We saw children with their hands marked. We saw men and women in their 20s who came from the country, the survivors. The country was flooded by that. I think that realization that the Jewish people and its presence in Europe sustained such a deadly blow is a second time of understanding that we may face extinction. And the third time was when the Arab armies invaded us in what was to be our war of independence. Once the Israel declared a statehood, once the British departed, we had armies invading us, not the Palestinians. We had an expeditionary force from Iraq who came close to the sea. We had an Egyptian expeditionary force. We had a Syrian force, and we had the Jordanian. And we were attacked from all fronts. Yes, we won the war of independence, but that's hindsight. At the time, it was touch and go. It was touch and go, and we could have lost that war. So we emerged of that war, having faced what we thought might be an existential threat, third time in one decade. I think the residue of this memory and memory matters is very much embedded in Israel's defense strategy, 
Um, and it's some of the lessons that we, we were small, we were isolated, we did not, the Jews in Europe did not have any friends who came to their rescue. And that is something that is not about to repeat, be repeated here. Israel, for once, has its defense capacity, and it is self-reliant in so many ways. And it has done relatively well in some of those battles. So, but this is being done because of the conviction, uh, which is also translated into either our intelligence performance, our military performance, and hopefully our national strategy performance. The aim is existence, yes, and peace. Peace is actually the objectives that we need to obtain. Are you hopeful for the future, is he? My answer to that as a man who is, uh, must have had experience is it depends. <laughs> you know. In the first place, that's a Jewish answer. I always say, if we will perform at our best form, professionally, nationally, humanly, as a society, and we did perform well, and sometimes extremely well, then I'm very optimistic. But if we will fail, if we will blunder, if we will commit mistakes as we did at several instances of our history, then I'm pessimistic. So tell me what it is. I don't know. But we certainly must give it a chance. My star sign is a Libra, the scale, so I can actually uh, I can understand that as well, uh, both points of view. Why? My scales are the same. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so um, it's, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Um, and I'm just wondering, where are you speaking to us from now? Are you in, in Tel Aviv? Yes, I'm in Tel Aviv. I'm in the house that I always lived in, believing that my home is my castle. Uh, and, um, and I'm taking part of some of these uh, uh, struggles to get our policies and our house in order and uh, to regain. And I believe that, again, I am a strong believer that if those of us who are the public servants, be it public servants on the policy level or policy uh, or public servants on the intelligence level, we should do our best professionally. And doing that gives us a better chance of success. You know, success is never guaranteed, but the odds of succeeding are greater if you do that. So I'm still, even in my retirement, um, active here and there in uh, advancing those things with many, many colleagues from uh, who are former veterans of either the Mossad or the Shin Bet or the uh, the policy circles. Uh, so that's where we're in. But at the same time, I can see that we are in the same boat with other countries. We have, you know, these shortcomings of our democratic structures and the malfunctioning of some of our governments is universal. And, and as you can see, personalities matter. Personalities matter. And I look again at Britain, and I ask myself, you know, this is this epitome of good government is now handling a major crisis in the health segment, strike, major political disruptions, some questionable leaders. Is that the best that England can provide? And then I look at our friends in other countries. I don't know. These are very odd times. Um, and yes, it does. It is true that if you ask me what one man does um, in retirement, we all become more philosophical. Well, thanks for sharing your philosophical insights with me this 
me this morning and with our listeners. It's been a pleasure to speak to you, Uzi. Thank you, Andrea. And I, thank you, and, uh, and I, I'm delighted at the existence of your institution. There's something to be said in favor of five. Thanks for listening to this episode of SpyCast. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on next week's show. The fact is that in many ways, the Second World War and the cooperation, the engagement at the different levels with the British establishment, military establishment, intelligence establishment, uh, as you said, you know, gave us our chops, gave us, not gave hands-on experience, very, very important experience with British resources. If you have feedback, you can reach us by email at spycast at spymuseum.org or on Twitter at INTL Spycast. If you go to our page at thecyberwire.com slash podcast slash spycast, you can find links to further resources, detailed show notes and full transcripts. I'm your host, Andrew Hammond, and my podcast content partner is Erin Dietrich. The rest of the team involved in the show is Mike Mincy, Memphis Von III, Emily Coletta, Emily Renz, Afu Anokwa, Ariel Samuel, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester and Jen Iben. This show is brought to you from the home of the world's preeminent collection of intelligence and espionage-related artefacts, the International Spy Museum. Spy Museum.